sitting there and I look over. It, it was like a glow or a sparkle. And it scares the living crap out of me. And my heart, my heart has never pounded that hard in my life. It was an old house. There were always bizarre electrical things happening. It became weirder and sort of snowballed. Look, Mom, look. Your daddy's a baby. I have to stop it. As a child, I was scared a lot. You know, really scared. <laughs> this particular night, it was my turn to spend the night with my grandmother. Suddenly, I'm sort of awoken to a feeling and it was sort of jolting. <gasps> started really hearing sounds that you can't really explain away. The sound of water, the sound of steps, as if somebody was in the house walking up the stairs. If you are open to an experience, it will find you. I'm not a person that every time I hear a crackle, or sound or something on the roof or something in the closet or something in the attic, I don't immediately say it's a ghost. However, I believe I have absolutely, for sure, have seen an apparition in my life, for sure. At 17, I was at an absolute crossroads. My parents were getting divorced. Um, just a year earlier, my grandmother had died, and she was a diabetic. And of all the grandchildren, she had loved me the best. I'm about to go from a boy to being a man. School uh, was not going very good for me, let's just put it that way. I was extremely independent, a rebel, bullheaded, and I knew in my soul that I wanted to make music in a band. But I came from an extremely, extremely small town with a lot of people that absolutely didn't believe that you could make it out of that small town. I'll never forget in my life what happened to me at this period that changed everything for me. It was, it was very cold, snowy outside, and it was January-esque. Here I was at this unbelievable period in my life where everything was caving in. I will never, ever forget sitting in the snow in, in my car, barely able to run, barely any gas. I was thinking about my grandma. And, and just looking around and saying, man, what is gonna my life gonna become? And this is it. On this day, I've gotta decide where I'm going in my life. That's a scary moment in your life, coming to that absolute crossroads. Musically in my life, I'd always had a band. I mean, even when I was young, young, we always had a band. And here I was, I had a band of guys that just, I had, Two believers, myself and our drummer, Ricky, and two non-believers that, that really just didn't believe we were going anywhere. Truthfully, they were holding us back. Very, very tough time in our life because we're all friends. People always say, and I want to straighten this out, one myth. People always say that it's drugs and, and women and alcohol that break up bands. Not when you're starting out. You know what breaks up your band? When you don't have enough gas money to get over to rehearsal, or you can't get out of work and you can't get there to play guitar or sing that night, and next thing you know, they get another singer in the band. Uh, if you couldn't buy a music gear to afford to go to the next level, to play a club, you were out. So believe me, we didn't have enough money uh, at that point to have drugs or hot women in our life. I went over to visit a friend of mine and we were in his basement, right? So we're sitting down in this basement that just had this horrible morning, and, and I'm sitting there just hanging out. And that's what we did. We hung out, we listened to tunes. 
I had the old school headphones where you stick these big headphones on your head. And I'm leaning back. And all of a sudden, just kind of out of the corner of my eye, I'm sitting there and I look over and I see this sort of, it, it was like a glow or a sparkle. And, and at first I thought to myself, okay, that's really strange. I'm like thinking, is that electricity? I'm, I, I, you know, there's electricity popping, I think. That's what I think it is. So I take the headphones off. My friend doesn't notice it. So I say, do you notice anything going on? And he's like, no. And, and I kind of check the area and there's nothing. There's no water on the floor. There's no, you know, electricity that could be sparking. There's nothing. It was just this glow. It was much more than a sparkle, it was a glow. I put the headphones back on. I'm sitting there again and I'm looking around the room and my friend leaves. I remember him going upstairs. My friend abandons me, goes upstairs. I looked over in the corner, and as plain as day, this ball of just light and energy appears. At that moment, I knew I am seeing this. I'm looking, and I'm seeing this. And it's floating, and it's strange. It was just this orb that was glowing. And my heart, and I say this, my heart has never pounded that hard in my life. I mean, I felt it, boom, boom, boom. I was like, OK, I looked around. I'm seeing if someone's playing a trick on me, and it scares the living crap out of me. And I'm one of those guys, I, I've got to believe in common sense. I'm like, there's got to be a reason. And I'm telling you right now, there was no rhyme and no reason for this orb, this ball, this, this electricity that was happening. And it glowed, and it just moved across the room slow. There was no rhyme and no reason for this orb. And that, that for me, right then and there, I'll tell you what, I don't know what it did, what it motivated. All I knew is I was getting the hell out of there. And I've never got out of a basement so fast in my life. It was insane. Now, it scared the hell out of me. But when I think back about it, it just motivated me enough to let me know that my life hanging out with these friends and this certain amount of people was about to go nowhere. So badly that day, I needed a sign and I got it. I truly believe that as much as it scared me that day, I will never forget this because I had band rehearsal that night with my band. I'll never forget going to the rehearsal, walking down in that basement and feeling really apprehensive. There was no question about what needed to be done. We need to get in the car right now, and I need to get to Los Angeles. I need to move on with my life. What I saw is exactly what motivated me to tell the guys, I'm giving you an ultimatum. I'm going to go make an attempt to try to make it big. Who's coming with me? And on that night, two of my friends were gone forever, and Ricky and me hung tight, put our band together, and moved out to LA. We got out to Los Angeles, and we fought really hard, and we fought really hard. From that moment on, completely, were unbelievably self-motivated. And in the early 90s, I was living in Malibu, California. We've now sold 18, 19 million records, right? And, and have had a really great career starting. I just bought a house in Malibu, and I'm looking out over this balcony. At this time, you know, my girlfriend living with me. And it was one of those unbelievable, beautiful sunsets. You know, she went downstairs. And I'm standing there looking at this, and I thought that my girlfriend had come back behind me and had wrapped her arms around me. I felt the presence of someone come up and put their hands on my shoulders. It was a warm feeling. It was almost like a friend. I turned around. It was my grandma. She was with me. 
and I had chills up and down my arm from that moment on. This wasn't a, you know, oh, a, a breeze blew by. That's how physical it felt. And I thought that they were kind of talking to me. It was almost like a, like, I, I wish you well. My grandmother and me were very close. I was six years old when I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And my grandmother had fought the battle with diabetes almost her whole life, and it eventually took her life. When she passed away, um, I will never forget at that funeral um, that I, I cried so hard. I cried so hard that I, I couldn't even barely walk into the room. I couldn't, look, I couldn't let go. This was her coming back and helping me not only guide my life, but also let me know that, that she's still there in my life. I look at all the things that have happened to me. I, I feel like I have a guardian angel out there, and I, and I truly believe that maybe, just maybe, this is one of those um, stories that may be more beautifully haunting than just haunting. And I think maybe, just maybe, what haunted me and what scared me may have also been what motivated me in my life. My grandmother was Micmac Indian. My grandfather was Micmac Indian, and, and I always wondered if there was something there. Maybe I just feel more in tune, maybe I'm more open to it than I realize. I believe, but I'm not okay with it. My mother and father and I, when I was a little girl, were living in Newfoundland. And we were staying in, or we were in the house, and I guess I was scared that night. And my dad had gotten in bed with me um, and read to me and sort of decided that he was sleeping with me that night. And my mom, in the middle of the night, She felt somebody get in bed with her, who she thought was my father, just climbing back in bed with her. And he put his arms around her. And she was laying on her side, and he put his arms around her. And it felt different. It was not his arms around her. And she looked, and the guy was getting out of bed and leaving the room. She only saw half of his body. It was from the, the, the waist up. That's how she always described it, that she saw this half a person leaving her bed, uh, having been in bed with her with his arms around her, leaving the room, and she just caught him on the way out the door. I, I, I remember being really shocked um, when she told me the story about the man in bed with her. I remember being really, really scared for her and seeing her reaction. And, and I just remember feeling uneasy about the, the knowledge that those things could, could actually happen then. I had moved here to L.A. in 96. I had shot my first film, made a lot of money, wanted to settle down and find, you know, build some roots and and found this house. I was not even driving. I didn't even have a car at this point. It was an old house, and although I'd renovated it and, and tried to bring it back to new, there were always bizarre electrical things happening. Flickering lights, which, which you know, you can kind of chalk up to just being electrical issues, but it became weirder and sort of snowballed into, into a very strange circumstance. We had an office on one side of the house, and it was sort of on the edge of the house. And um, one day, I walked in, and the CD play player was opening, closing. and the music coming on on its own and, and going off. It was just weird. I mean, you feel like there's somebody in the room with you.
It was scary, and yet you want to rationalize things. There's got to be some explanation for this, but you know, not really being able to put my finger on what it was. I always felt the more you believe and the more you recognize and accept that that might actually be happening, the more it was going to happen, and that scared me. It definitely played slightly into my decision, I think, to sell the house. And then I bought a brand new house in Sherman Oaks. For me, there was a peace of mind about moving into a brand new house that hadn't had a history, that hadn't had anyone sort of living in those walls. And my ex and I lived there together, and uh, I felt pretty confident about, about you know, moving, it, moving into a place that was just going to be ours. I was gonna go down to the kitchen to get, to grab a drink, and so I walked down the stairs. I'm in the house by myself. I'm so anal about the locking of the doors, especially when I was alone. I had an alarm system and, you know, all of that, but I was locking up the house and sort of securing the place for the night, and there was a door, and it was a, a dead, like a deadbolt that had a lock on it, and you know, I grabbed my drink, and the door was wide open. It was just unexplainable. And that's when things got even weirder. There was a door, and it was a, a dead, like a deadbolt that had a lock on it, and, and the door was wide open. It was just unexplainable. And that's when things got even weirder. I remember one specific incident. My son was very little at the time. He was about two and a half years old, and he was sitting with me. Look, Mom, look. The daddy and the baby. Look, Mom. Look, look. The daddy and the baby. It was just the, the clearest thing for him. And showing me, look at the baby and the daddy, and I just remember getting chills up and down my back and not wanting to turn around. And I just remembered sitting there. I'm all alone with my son and just not wanting to turn around, just thinking, oh, God, please don't, don't be there. But of course, you know, begrudgingly turning around. And of course, nothing's there. But that was just, that was one of those moments. I didn't even want to live in the house anymore. The first thing I wanted to do was leave. I was terrified. I have to stop it. I have to stop before it gets to that point where I'm going to actually see something, you know, an apparition or something in front of me. And I ended up selling the house. I then bought a house from the 1930s in Sherman Oaks in the hills. There was, on the side of the house, there was a deck, a very long deck off the house, a, a wooden deck. And my ex and I, we were putting luggage away and, and sort of getting moved in. Um, so we have a long deck here where there's a barbecue, a huge six burner, gigantic, very heavy, you know, with burners on the side and, and the big giant grill. Even to move the barbecue from, from place to place was a huge feat that took two or three people to like move it. And it was the middle of the day, beautiful, sunny California day. And we were going around to the, to the side of the house. And just, just as we turned, the heavy barbecue had moved and completely flipped over into this arrangement within a second. The barbecue had completely moved all the way in front of us. I mean, it, it was blocking us in, the, in that little side area of the house. It was absolutely blocking us in there. Definitely afraid, very afraid, and chills and not knowing how to, how to explain it. It was terrifying. I mean, it was really terrifying. And it was really the thing that made me realize for the first time, really realize for the first time, oh my goodness, something is following us because, you know, it happened at Laurel Canyon and now it's happening here. I feel like something's following me. I did look around and I heard something about burning sage in the corners of the room and 
I did do that, so I was walking around the house with sage in the corners of the rooms, and, and I think it was also just something to, for me to, uh, some sort of action that I could take. But even after I burnt the sage, the electrical things and the TV things, they kept happening any, anyway. I almost put my hands up now, and I'm just like, there's a part of me that's kind of just accepting of it. And as long as it's not too intense, I just go, fine. Maybe there is something in particular that I need to investigate, something specific that I need to find out about why these things keep happening. The incidents that have happened to myself and then my son seeing things and my mother's had several different experiences. These genetic connections between us three and, and we all have had these strange experiences and, and is there something genetically or spiritually in our lineage? I still go to bed at night, still feel at times that something is very much in the room and still afraid. And all I do is say, please don't show yourself to me. I don't want to, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see you. I don't want to see you. Please don't show yourself to me. I mean, that to me has become something that I live with. It's become kind of a normal way of life, <laughs> life for me. I, as a child, was very scared of the paranormal or ghosts, or nighttime, basically. I would have night fears, and it was those dreams where you're stuck somewhere and you can't escape, and it was awful. I would think that I saw things or I heard things, and it was pretty horrible. It was pretty traumatic for me. I was scared a lot, you know, really scared. I was about nine, and um, we were traveling to visit my grandmother, who lived in Texas. She's my father's mother, and we called her Nanny. We just loved it. We loved going to Texas. It was just so homey, and everybody's making, you know, buttermilk pancakes and biscuits and gravy and fried chicken, and everybody eats all together, and everybody's very loving and warm and funny and loud. and. It was just always a very, very happy time for us. My grandmother was just so funny and so full of life, and she always wore, you know, these sort of funny-looking house coats, you know, those quilted ones, and she was just neat. She was just really, really neat. I really feel like she and I had a great connection, and the humor and the laughter and the, the closeness, she just, was really um, special to me, very special to me. This particular trip was more or less to spend time with her. We knew she'd been ill. She had gone through a double mastectomy, and she had gone through chemo and radiation, I believe. She was still battling it. When we went to stay with her, my older sister and I would take turns sleeping in her bed with her. This particular night, it was my turn to spend the night with her in her bed. That day, my nanny had to go to the hospital. And when my father came home, he said that they were going to keep her there. And they wanted to keep her there to run more tests. But I still wanted to sleep in her bed that night. Come on. 
I ended up going to bed that night in her bed, knowing that she wasn't gonna come home, but it was still on some level comforting to know I could have her smells and her things around and everything. I ended up going to bed that night in her bed, knowing that she wasn't gonna come home. Suddenly I'm sort of awoken to a feeling and, and sort of jolting. And at the foot of the bed, right at the end of the bed, I see my nanny standing there. And I thought, oh, well, nanny, came home, I guess, from the hospital. And she had her long nighty and then this colorful house coat. There, she is like a couple feet away from me. And I, you know, I said, hi, hi nanny. nanny. It was very peaceful in her tone. And she said, I came to say goodbye. And I know when she was talking to me, she sounded very serene, very sort of almost whispery. It's okay. It's Nanny. I want to say goodbye. When she said, it's me, it's Nanny, I want to say goodbye, I was confused by that. It's okay, Nanny. And then I sort of settled back thinking, okay, well, she's going to get into bed with me, so I scooted over. It was a relief. I mean, I was like, oh, I can sleep tonight. I'm not going to get scared. I'm not going to have to wake up and run into my parents' room. And it was comforting to me, uh, especially knowing that I had night fears and nightmares and had trouble going to sleep at night and always wanting to sleep with someone. So I loved that I could spend the night with her in her bed. So I just kind of lulled myself back to sleep. I was slept like a baby. I was, it was very sound sleep. I woke up and I didn't see Nanny next to me and I heard noises downstairs and so I just assumed, well, she might have just gone down to the kitchen to make breakfast. I went down into the kitchen and there was my father and mother. They said, we need to talk to you. And they said, you know, she was really sick and she didn't make it through the night. She died last night. And um, so, I couldn't believe it, and I I thought to myself, because I thought I would find her there, and I I just couldn't believe she died. And I, but I saw her. She, she came, came into her room. room. She came into the room, and she was talking to me. And I said, well, Nanny didn't come home. She didn't come home last night. She was in the hospital. She didn't come home. I don't think I was that aware that she was as sick as she was. I think because of her personality, you just she didn't act sickly. So, uh, you know, it was it was pretty I didn't expect her to go like that. I didn't think she would go. I didn't think she was going to die. And then it kind of hit me and it's like, "Oh, that's why she was saying goodbye." She came and appeared to me to say goodbye to me before she left. I really was struck by that. And, and just knowing that, I guess she felt that it was important to do that. Maybe it was important for her to comfort me in some way, uh, knowing that nighttime scared me. And maybe it was in some way of her saying, well, I'll always be with you. I definitely 
took great comfort in knowing that maybe I was being protected. It helped me, you know? It helped me believe that I wasn't alone and that I, that I could be comforted by the unknown. And that's really what scared me was a lot of the unknown. Really, she is there. Even though she might have left in her body, she's still a presence and her spirit is still around and she's there to comfort me and protect me. That's how it feels to me and that's what it felt like then is what that meant to me was that she was letting me know I was gonna be okay. And yes, she was saying goodbye. She was also not saying goodbye. She was also saying, here I am. It was a very profound experience for me as a child. It obviously has stayed with me. It, it, was, it, was, it was very special. I kind of always knew and uh, accepted the fact that I would have one of these experiences at some point. I know that if you're open to those things, they find you. I mean, that I grew up with, that idea. I mean, my mother really is of the school of thought that if you are open to an experience, it will find you. Three months ago, I was going with my boyfriend to visit friends in Charleston, South Carolina. It was the first time that I was coming to visit there with him. He has family in Charleston, and they had a family home in downtown Charleston in a really historic area. It's a carriage house among all these different carriage houses that are really well preserved. I mean, things are really kept the way they were. You can kind of step back in time when you're there. The house is just exquisite. It's been there forever. And um, really like immaculately kept. The cleaning lady had just been there. It's like a really lovely place. Upstairs on one side, there's a master bedroom that has an ensuite bathroom with a big tub in it. And then next to the stairs, there's another bedroom there. My boyfriend, he said sort of in passing that there was a ghost. And he was saying, no, you have to understand, it's totally fine, we've all been around it, it doesn't feel bad. It's not one of these ghosts that you're aware is trying to do something mean to you or manipulative or trying to scare you, basically. And so I kept on saying to him, you know, does, does anybody know who this ghost is? I mean, I know it's an old house. And he said, no, you know, we don't really know. Nobody really knows. We know it's a woman. It's an old house. And of course, in a lot of old houses in Charleston, there are ghosts. I think that from his behavior, because he wasn't scared at all, and I didn't want to seem like that annoying chick who just is scared of everything. <laughs> so I thought, you know what, how bad can this be? At that point, I just convinced myself that nothing was going to happen. I took a bath really quickly because there was this beautiful bathtub in the bathroom that was attached to the master bedroom. We got changed for dinner, and when we got back home pretty late. I was meeting a lot of people for the first time that I had met before, Kyle's friends. So um, the ghost in the house by the time we got home was pretty far from my mind. It was not really something I was thinking about anymore. I was kind of getting ready for bed, and I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth and washing my face and putting lotion on, whatever girls do. I heard like a, the sound of water. 
like, for example, as if I had been laying in the tub and had like put a leg up. And I looked behind me and I was kind of getting ready for bed, and I was in the bathroom, and I looked behind me, and there was nothing there. I mean, I'd taken a bath earlier in the day, but it wasn't full anymore, and, you know, nothing was in there. That was weird, and I tried to convince myself it's nothing. You can hear things all the time, and it's an old house. I mean, I feel like everybody has that excuse. It's an old house. We went to bed, and he was fast asleep. I mean, I was exhausted. He was asleep by the time I even got into bed. Almost immediately, I started really hearing sounds that you can't really explain away sounds on the stairs. Definite sound of steps, just walking up, not fast, not slow, as if somebody was in the house walking up the stairs. And then kind of walking around in the hallways and into the other bedroom. And it was extremely scary. Of course, we were the only people there, and we were in the bedroom, and he was asleep. There was really nothing I was going to do about it. I certainly wasn't going to open the door and see what was going on. I was nervous, but I was also exhausted. And like physically, like my body went over my mind, thank God, and I fell asleep. And so finally, morning comes. I open the door, and I go into the hallway and was about to go down the stairs when I noticed that the other bedroom door was open. And the bed that had been perfectly made was completely rumpled. All of the sheets were in a ball as if somebody had been sleeping there. There was an indentation in the pillow. I knew that we had locked the door downstairs and our bedroom door was locked. So all of a sudden, I realized that that sound was the ghost. And almost at the same moment, out of my peripheral vision next to the window, I saw a thing, this presence there in the broad daylight. It was definitely a figure of a sort of uh, like ethereal quality. It scared me how physical it was. Didn't feel like it was watching me. It felt like it was just there looking out the window. But it was daylight. When you think of seeing a ghost, you don't think of seeing it during the day. I felt a panic just descend on me, and my heart started beating really quickly. I mean, I didn't even want to see one thing. I didn't want it to move. I didn't want it to come near. I ran, ran back into the bedroom where my boyfriend was. And I said, you know, look in here. Just tell me if there's something in there. He looked in the room. He said, well, there's nothing in here now. There's no explaining that away. I started feeling more and more panicked. And he said, OK, well, now I just have to tell you. We know who the ghost is. And he went on to tell me this story. 10 years ago, before the family had bought the house, there had been a young woman in her 30s who was a school teacher living at the house. Directly next door, there was the son of a family who was severely mentally deranged. 
And he became obsessed with this young school teacher who was living at this house. And it progressed to the point where she had to take out a restraining order against him. And it was this whole drama. <clears throat> and one day, <sighs> he violated his restraining order and he was thrown in jail. The tragedy of this story is that when they released him from jail, she had no idea that he was on the loose again. He went directly to her home, broke in, He eventually was arrested, and it was a local tragedy. Her death happened in such a sudden and violent way that I don't think she even realizes that she's dead. She's there, and she's really a physical presence there because she just really thinks she still lives there, and she's going about her life the same way. And when I heard that water, that's the bathtub she died in. That was her bedroom that the sheets were messed up in. And I think more than feeling scared after that, I felt really sad for her that, you know, people are there living in her house and she must be extremely lonely and she hasn't progressed past being just dead. Her energy hasn't moved on. It was bizarre learning that the details that I had picked up on were actually a part of her story, and it definitely convinced me of uh, the reality of her presence there. <laughs>